Hi, welcome to lecture 13.1. Today we're going to talk about uh, working with equations of motion uh, that have non holonomic constraints, so constraints with the motion of the system. Uh, we'll start with non holonomic constraints because they're a bit easier to handle than um, uh, holonomic constraints, and that'll be next. But uh, we're going to see how we can use the formulation that we presented to. Um, work with these equations and simulate them just like any other um, uh, systems that we've already done. And you've already, I think, too, in your homework, uh, touched on this a bit with uh, one of the examples. So um, we will go over that again uh, to strengthen the ideas. But at first, I want to uh, just take a little bit of an aside to um, talk about one particular non holonomic constraint that is uh, sometimes difficult to think about. So um, we're going to talk about the uh, rolling without slip. So if I have a wheel of some sort, so let's say I have a disk just in this plane here and um, we'll call this disk B, body B. And then um, let's say then I have some ground that I could put the disk in contact with. I'll call that A. Um, So first, imagine that uh, this disk is not in contact with the ground. Let's say it has um, a center point here, which I'll call C. And if I um, fix C in A, so in this case, we would say that the velocity of C in A equals zero, so it doesn't move. And then I take this disk and I give it an angular velocity omega. So now this disk is spinning with some angular velocity omega except that v uh, point C does not move in A. Then if I'm viewing um, this disk from A and I think about some of the points on the disk then uh, we could figure out the velocity if we knew the radius. So let's just say we do know the radius. I'll uh, say the radius here is r. And now let's think about some of the points. I can pick any point um, on the disk. Let's start, I'll just pick this point. And if I know that um, c here is fixed in a, then the velocity of any other point on the disk is going to be omega cross uh, the position vector to that point. So in this case, um, for this point, I would get some velocity that is tangent to the disk surface here, and it would have right, a velocity magnitude of omega times r. And you can pick any other point on this disk and we're going to always get this tangent velocity. All right, so wherever I pick, I get the, um, and each of them will have a magnitude of omega cross r. So I can pick any of these points that are fixed in B, right, and then calculate what the, the velocity is. And each of them have a magnitude of omega r, and then we see that the direction is always going to be such that they are tangent um, to the wheel here. Right. So now, um, this particular point, we'll call it PB, um, is the point that's fixed in B. It has this velocity omega r in A. So I could write over here that the velocity of PB in A equals um, 
and I'm just going to say that the magnitude equals omega r there. Right. Since I don't have any coordinate systems set up, um, and I guess I got to add that just for the sake of this. So I could say these two things are ax and a y. So then I can write that uh, this velocity is omega r negative in the a x direction. Okay. I can also then um, pick a point here in a. No. Let's do that in black. And let's say I pick this point. It's directly under C and PB. And um, I'm going to call that point PA. Right? So A, PA, sorry, is going to be fixed in A. So velocity of PA and A is 0. It's directly under point C and PB at this instant of time. And I can see that. Um, there's a difference in velocity. Uh, so the velocity of PB in A is just this um, omega times r in the negative ax direction. So um, the relative velocity between PA and PB is the velocity of PB in A, because A, PA is fixed in A. Right? And if I then imagine um, taking this disk that's spinning at omega and lowering it all right so i uh and lower the disk down and it gets closer and closer to um, the ground if i then let it contact the ground if the um if there's no friction between the ground and uh, the disk, then I would get a, a sliding or slipping disk, right? So I could lower C, keep this, this thing spinning, and it would slide, and I would always have a relative velocity of omega r in the negative ax direction relative to a in this point pa, right? So that is, um, we can think about this then as a fully sliding, or, or you can say slipping disk in this case. Uh, sliding and slip are used uh, for particular, uh, as particular ter terminology in wheels, but we'll use them, uh, we'll call them the same thing in this case. But I think you can see then that we'll have this relative velocity, and that this point PB, which is fixed in B, right then, has this velocity that I've drawn. And that would be the uh, relative velocity two between PA and PB. Right. So now, if we say that this disk doesn't slip, um, that means that there cannot be any relative velocity between PA and PB. So let me just sketch another disk so we can uh, work with that. Oops, that's not a disk. So I get my wheel here, and then a ground. I'm going to draw it in contact at this point. And um, we'll have the contact point. All right. And we'll have C, and we'll have uh, both PA, sorry, PB, which is fixed in the body B, same point that we had over here, uh, but also at this, in that exact same location, right, then we have a PA, which is fixed in uh, A, All right? So for the no slip condition, that means that um, the velocity of BB in A minus the velocity of B a and A must equal zero, right? So we have no relative velocity between these two points, or that those two velocities are are equal. Oop, and I'm drawing over my head a bit. Let me move some stuff. Let me just scooch this here. 
and then we move this over a bit. All right. So the velocity now between these two points, and remember that PB is fixed in B, and PA is fixed in A at this instant of time, and that they can't have any relative velocity. If that's the case, um, this point actually becomes uh, an instantaneous center of this uh, body B. And if I still have this uh, omega, right, I can still apply the two-point theorem, and I could figure out then uh, if I unfix C, right, so C is no longer pinned, and, uh, and just to remind us in that picture here, maybe I could say something like this, right, sort of pinned. Now I, I don't have C pinned. Well, that means then that the velocity of C is going to have to be omega crossed R also. So if this is also R, then we have um, omega R here. And if then I come all the way to this top point, for example, um, if I know that this velocity is omega r, then I have to add a second omega across to r to get the velocity up here. And then this thing is going to be twice the magnitude in the same direction. And I would get uh, 2 omega r as a magnitude up here. And um, if I pick any point actually along this vertical line, the velocities uh, will follow like this um, dotted line, and I'll get uh, just a ratio of whatever distance I'm from, uh, the point A. Uh, it'll start at a velocity of zero here for this any fixed point along this vertical line in the disk at that instant of time, and then I'll have these velocities. So this is the no-slip constraint that the two points, the one fixed in B and the one fixed in A, can't have any relative velocity. And, um, and then this disk will row forward with some uh, velocity at center, omega r, but the point at the top is moving at twice that speed. Right? This is viewed from A still. And at any instant of time, if I look at that point that's fixed on the disk that happens to be sitting at the location of contact at that point of time has to have a velocity of zero in the no-slip scenario. Okay, So I hope that uh, maybe this help gives you a better idea of how we're thinking. You can think about multiple points here, B A and P B, one fixed in A, one fixed in B, and this relative velocity between the two. But there's also you know, a third point that you can think about too, right? This uh, wheel that's not slipping would also be moving um, in, uh, if I picked a point here, Oops. let's say I picked a point here and I call it O, and, yeah. and I call that O, right? Then um, the center of this disk if I tracked the distance here with some coordinate, we'll just call it Q. So I've got this uh, Q here, then um, Q dot, right, would equal omega R in that case. And uh, in this point C, um, when I'm standing in A, it will um, travel forward and look like it's moving. But there's another point here um, at the contact that's also going to look like it's moving. So if I'm standing in A and I'm watching some point that's, slide, that's moving along the ground plane that's always in contact with the wheel, I can track it with a coordinate Q. And that's sort of a third point that you can think about there. It has um, this uh, velocity q dot, and um, but that point isn't fixed in B. If I pick the point that's fixed in B, the PB, and it has a velocity of zero at any instant of time, as long as I pick the point fixed in B that happens to be at the contact point.
right? So there's an infinite number of points around this disk, but we're always talking about that the specific one that's in contact doesn't have a relative velocity to the specific one that's fixed in A. There. And, uh, and we're not talking about this uh, points that do move around in space, right? Those are not points that are fixed in A. It's a, it's a, it's a different point. Uh, or not fixed in A or B. Right. Okay, well I hope that helped clear that up a little bit and uh, help you think more carefully about how you're setting up these relative velocity constraints for um, a no-slip scenario. And I will pause. All right, so uh, that was a little basic intro there to remind us and think about that uh, rolling valve slip, but uh, the topic, the primary topic of the day is going to be uh, forming equations of motion and simulating them uh, if you have non-holonomic constraints present. Right. So, we know that um, if we have a system with no constraints, we have um, Q generalized coordinates, and um, we're going to have N of those. Okay, so we have these generalized coordinates that describe the configuration of our system, and they're a minimal set here. Right. We have no extra holonomic constraints. And then we can introduce these also um, in generalized speeds. And the connection between these two um, are the kinematical differential equations. So we have this F K which is a function of q dot, u, q, and t. And that equals to zero. Uh, these are linear in the q dots and the u's, and you can solve for the q dots. So the q dots um, have some linear coefficient matrix here, and then I call the remainder uh, g k, and that all has to be equal to zero. And you can solve for q dot if you solve this linear system of equations, right? And f k in this case, um, this is also in. Uh, we have uh, little in number of kinematical differential equations. And then we also have the dynamical differential equations. So in general you would have uh, some FD that is a function of U dot, U Q, and t equal to zero, and that also they happen to be linear in the u dots, so you get md u dot plus gd has to equal to zero, and we would have n of those. Right? So that's uh, the system we've already dealt with. It's just a normal system with no um, extra holonomic constraints and no uh, non-holonomic constraints. If we have some non-holonomic constraints, then um, we get the this equation, right? Uh, so for a non-holonomic constraint, we have some relationship between uh, the u's, and there are going to be also possibly q's in this equation, and t equals zero, but we don't have any uh, dots. Uh, so this is an algebraic equation. Uh, 
algebraic equation um, and uh, these are the non holonomic constraints. Right? And there are, um, these also can be written uh, in a linear way. They are linear in the U's here. Okay. Um, we get in, I'm sorry, M equations, so little m holonomic equations here, non holonomic equations here, that are linear in the U's. But we can then partition U into some independent U's and dependent U's. All right. And we can pick some of those U's to be dependent, and, we, and they, we can pick M of those to be dependent. So you are the dependent U's. They are of little M length. And then U's, there will be P of those, right? Where P equals little n minus M, okay? So if we do that and we partition these, um, this non holonomic constraint by definition is linear in all of the U's, but we can then solve only for the dependent U's. So we can write a M N times U R plus, I don't, I don't know why I'm putting a bar over the M, that's not my notation, um, a G, I keep writing a Q, but a G N um, equals to zero. Okay. So we can find the coefficient matrix of only the dependent U's, and we could solve for these uh, dependent U's. Right? So if we solve for these dependent U's, Then we'll have some ur equals negative m in inverse uh, times g n there. And this right hand side uh, is only a function of the independent u's, all of the q's, and the t. So um, um, I'll just note that g of n as a function of the independent u's, all of the q's, t, and then m of n will be a function of uh, just all of the q's and the t's. So that's what's left over on this right hand side. We solve for the um, dependent u's. If we solve for the dependent u's, we can take that and substitute them in into our kinematical and dynamical differential equations uh, to reduce what we have there. So substitute um, ur into fk and fd. If we do that, then fk, the kinematical differential equations, are going to look like um, q dot comma us right we're now only left with the independent u's uh, q and t that equals to zero and we still have um, we're going to have a uh, little n of these right one for each of the q's or q dots and then for the dynamical difference equations, though, once we form those um, using Kane's equation, we're going to end up with only equations that are in terms of the independent speeds. So then we're going to have equations that look like this. All right? In there, we're only going to have P left of those. So here we have um, 
n plus p, ordinary differential equations in terms of the q dots and the u's, and because we've substituted in our uh, non-holonomic constraints here, then those non-holonomic constraints will hold with this reduced set of equations. All right. So these are um, uh, sort of a new set of ordinary differential equations uh, where um, f of n uh, equals to zero holds. And that's what we have to form. Um, if we can form these equations, then uh, we can also um, solve for them and uh, write them in an explicit form. So then you can end up writing your uh, q dot equals some uh, negative mk times gk, right? And your us dot equals some negative md minus 1 uh, gd. Right. And these equations we can um, simulate just like we've done before, and uh, the non-holonomic constraint should hold in this case because we've built them into the equations. Right. Um, one other key thing to note here, like I wrote this non-holonomic constraint as an algebraic equation, right, instead of differential equations. So we have a set of differential algebraic equations which we can transform because the algebraic part happens to be linear in the u's we can transform them into a, a set of ordinary differential equations um, by doing that explicit solve there and that's nice um, and it's uh, um, there there are some downsides right this solve you always end up with things in the denominator of your dependent u's um, and if those things ever have to be zero then you might get some numerical trouble because we can't divide by zero, okay? So that's one thing to look out for, but um, it is, uh, in general, um, not that big of a deal. Sometimes you have to set your initial conditions such that they're not exactly zero, but uh, you can solve this and you can have uh, a fully working valid system that uh, doesn't have any uh, constraint error that builds up and we'll learn more about the errors associated with constraints in uh, the following lesson. All right, so um, that's the intro, and we will start with um, a dual problem to see how that works in practicality. And uh, okay, so we're going to come back to the snake board problem that we introduced in the holonomic chapter. And uh, yep, I think I can do this. So if we go back to the non holonomic constraints chapter, um, at the bottom, we have the snake board. So this uh, device here lets you do a non-holonomic propulsion. Um, it has two joints, uh, three basic bodies, and then we're going to model these wheels just as point contacts, but they're not going to have any lateral slipping. Okay, so the uh, if we pick a point that's fixed in the wheel, and uh, and a point that's fixed in the plane, ground plane. Um, we won't then have any lateral velocity or relative velocity between those two. And we've already set up the uh, non holonomic constraints for that system in that lesson. And now we're going to see how that translates into um, setting up the system uh, equations of motion. So what I'm going to do, I think, is uh, copy, copy some of the setup here. Let's first create a new notebook and I'll name this uh, non holonomic EON. And then if I just grab uh, the symbols, copy that in, we'll get these. Reference frames, copy that in, and I don't need that, but I'll need these positions, and we do want to set the velocity of point O, 
and then set the get the, velo get the velocity of so these two. Alright, and then this is about where we let me get the kinematic differential equations here. Alright, I think that's where I want to start, and I need to import um, I think that should work. Let's see. Yep, I'd executed. So we um, have our coordinates here, Q1 through Q5. And then I have uh, these reference frames. Uh, B and C are the two foot plates, and A is the connector body uh, between the two. Um, I've set up the angular coordinates here. We've set up some uh, points, and these are going to represent the mass centers of bodies A, B, and C. And then we've uh, captured their positions. And then I've calculated the velocities. Um, so O is uh, not moving in A. And then we get the velocities of um, B, O, and C, O. And I think um, in the velocity of A, O will be automatically calculated there from its derivative of this position. I introduce some speeds. And then we have some generalized coordinates. And, and I pick one. Um, non-trivial generalized coordinate. Actually, I'm going to change change that up a bit, so I'll make that a new cell. But that gives us the basic setup here for the problem. So uh, let's change these. Um, let's call this now FK instead. So we're going to create a, a simpy matrix. And I'm going to set up the U1 will set up the equations like so. So we're just going to get the left hand side of the FK equation. U2 is minus Q and U3 minus this, U4 minus this, and U5 minus Q5. Right. All right, so this, these are our kinematical differential equations just in, in implicit form there. We can solve for the u's um, or the q's from those, q dots from those equations. And I have one that's not the non-trivial one, so we can see how that uh, plays out there. The, uh, so those will be our kinematical differential equations, and let's... Um, Go ahead and solve for the q dots for these, uh, and then we can use them to do some substitution. So, if we have these uh, general left hand sides of these uh, equations and we know certain things are linear, in this case, we know that these equations are linear in the q dots, then um, if I create a q1, q2, q3, q4, q5, and then I can do a um, q dot equals q dot diff and if I don't put a t in there um, it's only they're only a function of t so I should get um, my q dot vector now uh, to extract the linear coefficients of the q dots I can take uh, fk dot the Jacobian which gives me the partial derivatives of all those equations with respect to each q dot term and I should get the coefficients there. And so uh, I get all one negative ones, but that one minus the over two. And then the remainder, if I substitute in then the q dots equals zero, I uh, get our gk term. So the easiest way to do that, if I do a q dot zero, I create a little dictionary. And I can say um, q dot, the ith q dot, is equal to zero for um, q dot i in 
few dots. So that'll loop through there and give me this substitution vector here that I can, or substitution dictionary, so I can replace with zeros. And then I got gk equals fk dot x replace uh, qd zero. And that should give me that remainder term. Okay, so I get just all the use, straightforward. And then I can I could symbolically solve for the q dots now that I have these coefficients. And the way to do that is um, we'll call it the q dot solution equals minus because we have to move one to the one side of the equation there. Mk dot lu solve does Gaussian elimination um, of that matrix mk and the vector tk and then I should get my solution there. So q, q dot equals u1, q1, q dot, u1 dot equals u1, q2 dot equals u2, q3 dot equals this 2u3 over l. Right, and I solve. So that was a little long-winded way because it's pretty simple equations, but this process will always work no matter how complex your kinematical difference equations or any other equations that you have these linear coefficients. Uh, lastly, let's make a q dot replacement vector. And a quick way to do that is make a dictionary. If I zip the q dot terms and the q dot solution terms, and that should give me a way to replace q dots with things that are only functions of the different u's. Right? And uh, in the in the example back here, we sort of start with that, um, and um, but I'll just do that manually here. All right, so we've got our kinematical differential equations. At this point, we should be able to calculate our non-holonomic constraints. So if we look at our figure, uh, the key thing is that the uh, any point on body B or any point on body C that are fixed there can't have any relative velocity in the lateral direction. Um, with the ground there. And uh, did I add more to this figure? Oh yeah, I did. Actually, I'm using an old figure in the Wacom, but uh, the directions that we're um, interested in are going to be the C X direction and the B um, C Oh no, C A. Sorry, the C Y and the B Y directions. Right, so that these two, uh, these directions are the Y components of those local uh, reference frames for the B and the C bodies. So we're not going to have any velocity there. Um, we have these points C O and B O. We only have to pick one point on those bodies to to set up the velocity constraint because it's going to be the same for any point on the body, and we can use uh, the velocities of C O and B O. So to do that, I'm going to get my non-holonomic constraints. We're going to make that a matrix. And uh, these are scalar quantities. And the idea then is that the um, if I have BO dot velocity in N, um, can't have a velocity component in the BY direction. So if I dot that with B dot Y, and then I do similarly do the CO dot velocity in N, and dot that with B dot, uh, C dot Y, I should get some non holonomic constraints here. And we could probably trig simp that if we'd like. They're not too complicated expressions. And maybe that's a little easier to read. Right? So there we go. We've got um, these are our two non holonomic constraint equations. Right? We've got five. Um, generalized speeds, and now we've got two constraint equations, so we're going to end up with a uh, p equals 3 degree of freedom system once we apply these. All right. So what is going to be helpful now is to put all of these in terms of the generalized speeds. So we can make some replacements. If I do fn.x replace q.repl, then I get 
my non-whole number constraints only in terms of the u's and not the q dots. Right? So I've got the u's and the q's here. Something that's quite useful, um, and I'll just rename that fn, uh, especially when equations get quite long, if I use the me.findDynamic simples fn of that expression there, right, it shows me that then the only time varying things in this non holonomic constraint are u's and q's. Right? And that's where we want to get it. I don't want to have any q dots. And this find dynamic symbols is very helpful for examining, especially larger expressions, to make sure that it contains what you want. So I'll, I do this often to make sure we have uh, a system that we want here. All right, so we have some non holonomic constraints. We can now solve them for the dependent u's. And I forget, I think I used uh, the dependent u's. We said were what? Um, ur equals u1 and u2. Yeah. And I guess just to do something different, we could do uh, um, that uh, u4 and u5 are the dependent u. So why don't we do that? So I'm going to make a little vector here. Those are going to be my dependent u's. Right, and we can grab two a matrix of independent U's, which is going to be U1, U2, and U3. And I think that's, I meant to do U4 and U5. Right, those are the two. Yeah. Uh, that's not going to help us though. Um, I do need to choose U1, U2, or U3, right? Uh, because those are the only ones present in Fn. So we do need to do that. And then we'll do U3, U4, and U5. So it's important to think about why is that the case, right? The angular velocities of the two bodies, B and C, the Q, uh, U4 uh, and U5, have no bearing on whether or not the points BO and CO have a lateral velocity. So we don't see those present here. Um, all right, so we choose our dependents, right? Dependent and independent. Yep. So just like we did before, we can extract the coefficients to the um, dependent use here. So I'm going to say m n uh, equals fn dot Jacobian ur. We can have a look at that. That's the linear coefficients to the u1 and u2. Right? And then uh, we're going to need a remainder term. So I'll do a ur 0 equals uh, ur the ith ur equals zero for ur i and ur. That works. And then gn will then be fn dot x replace ur zero. That should give us those two remainder terms. U three cosine. Yep, right there looks good. And then we can solve. Uh, so we're going to get ur solution equals minus mn dot lu solve gn. And we get our solution there. Might as well, we can run a trick simple on that. It shouldn't be too hard to solve. And we'll get a ur solution. And you are so. Takes a little bit of thinking. Actually, it doesn't reduce it much. Um, but we do get, you know, we get these terms now that there are some divisor div uh, dividends, I guess you would say, or 
the denominators of these things and we if we look carefully at them um, you know, certain values could cause some denominator terms to be zero I feel like they should simplify more you are solution I don't know why it's not but it did see that did it you can use different methods in trick sim anyways we'll do that but we do see that we've got some terms here um, if q5 equals q4 and that could be zero sine of zero zero we could have problems all right so we're gonna have to watch out for um, and q5 equals to q4 for all of these terms there so that's one one downside when we solve for these we do introduce this possibility of these divide by zeros you can choose different generalized speeds to maybe avoid that um, but uh, something to be aware of and we'll see it later on and then I got a ur REPL equals uh, dict, dict zip ur and ur solve so this will let us replace now any dependent speeds with independent speeds, right? So we've got our u1 and u2 that are function only of q, uh, u3 in these cases. All right. So now once we've done that, we need to substitute um, these in to our uh, equation. So let's start with the kinematical difference equations which we have them in this mk form, gk, right? And we know that u1 and u2, we can rewrite in terms of these uh, replacements here. So if I do um, x replace ur REPL, now I've got the right-hand side of our kinematic difference equations only in terms of u3, u4, and u5. So I'm going to replace rename GK so that it's we only have now MK and GK in terms of the independent use U3, 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 U4, U5 yeah all right now let's uh, work on some velocities we're going to need the velocities of the three mass centers to calculate the equations of motion and the angular velocities of each body if they all have inertia, right? So I'm gonna do a little different than the on my notes. I'm gonna make the inertia of AO zero, so that one's not gonna matter, uh, and only give inertia to uh, B and C here. So they'll simplify things a little bit, and we'll also make uh, A massless, so we don't have to worry about that. So let's just do um, a mass and an inertia value. So we're going to need those as scalar symbols. Each uh, foot pad will have the same mass, and each uh, foot pad will have the same inertia. We're going to need those eventually. Um, so let's get our velocities and our partial velocities correct. Uh, what velocities do we need? We need to substitute and get the velocities written only in terms of the um, independent u's in this case. So we're going to need the velocity of BO and N and the velocity of CO N, right? and then we're going to need um, the angular velocities B dot angvel and N that's supposed to be in, in and c dot ing bell and in. All right, so right now I have them all in terms of the q dots. So our first step is going to be to substitute in the q dots. So if I x replace uh, uh, q dot REPL. That looks good. And then x replace ur REPL to get it only in terms of the independent speeds. Then I've got my velocity expression I want. And we're going to call that um, velocity of BO. 
in it. All right, and then we can do the same. I just copy this. Do N V C O. And that was supposed to be B O. N V C O. And N V B O. All right. So the equations are a bit more complex here, but that's okay. Um, the computer can handle that just fine. And then I'll do the same replacements for and then we call this n omega b and n omega b. and then n omega c and n omega c all right so now i have uh, all of the important velocities that we need only written in terms of the independent generalized speeds and we can then um, get some partial velocities here. So I can do a, uh, a VBO, VCO, WB, uh, omega C equals ME dot partials velocity. If I then give it those uh, velocities in the same order, in VBO, in V. C O N Omega B N Omega C and then give it uh, a list of only the independent generalized speeds and then a reference frame to calculate those in. We should be able to, we should have then some partial velocities here. So if I look at the partials of BO, I get um, these two vectors. And VCO and looks almost the same. We have minus, no, nope, we're looking good. And then uh, W, B, and omega, C. All right, so these are the non homonomic partial velocities here that we've carefully eliminated all of the dependent speeds, and we get those partial velocities. Now we can formulate the um, coefficients of motion. So we don't I don't have any uh, external forces acting on the system, right? It's a planar uh, skateboard. I don't have like gravity acting on it. I don't have any springs. I don't have anything that is uh, present. So we're not going to have an FR term. We're not going to have any generalized active forces on the system because I just haven't specified them. Uh, we could, and in fact, in your homework, you're going to have to uh, apply some generalized active forces such that you can make this skateboard move in or snakeboard move in a, in a way that you want so all we have to do is figure out though for this purpose uh, fr star and we're going to need the accelerations of the points and the angular velocities this is a planar system too so we don't have to have the most the super complex um, 3d uh, rotational equation Euler's equation uh, we're only going to have that an i times an alpha type of term which will be nice and uh, it'll be a bit simpler here to determine the equations of motion. Right? So we're going to do um, F, we're going to have an F3, 4, and 5 for the dependent speed. So if I have an F3, S, 3, S, uh, will be our, our first one. And before we do that, Let's create um, two iner inertia dyadics. So do a um, i about um, a o. I think that's my notation, and I can just use this inertia function to well, 
We'll just do it so we know. We will only have this um, uh, Z component, right? Z is out of the board, I believe. Let's double check that. Yeah, I think I'm using an old figure there. So Z is out of the board, so we can say I times ME dot outer of uh, in dot Z, in dot Z works. And then it's, um, this is also the same for the B. Oh, we're doing B, sorry, and C. It's also the same for C. So I can just say I, B, B, O. Same inertia dyadic for both of those, um, but one will be associated with the angular velocity of one body and one with the other one. Uh, we're going to need to check out the accelerations. So let's uh, see what we get here. We have um, um, our velocities. So we have an NVBO, for example. If I take the time derivative of it in N, I get an acceleration term. And notice I've got a bunch of Q dots in here. Let's use ME.find dynamic symbols. And you, if you're giving it a vector, you have to tell it which reference frame you want to investigate it in. And we see that we have these q3 dot, q4 dot, q5 dot that we want to eliminate um, with the U's. And then we want to get rid of the uh, U's there too. So let's do that. I'm going to have an NABO equals this dot x replace first get rid of the q dot so we'll do a q dot repl replace q if i can type it i think that's it and then we'll get u's there in place of those and we want to x replace those u's with the ur repl And then I'm going to not print that whole expression because it might be a big, nasty mess. But we can check if we've got a, what we expect. So now I have Q3, Q4, Q5, which we can have any Qs. I've only got a depend, I mean, independent Us, U3, 4, U5. And then I've got a U3 dot there. So that's looking pretty good. Let's then do the one for CO. Uh, this is going to be A, C, C, and C. That one looks good too. And then uh, we can do the same thing for the angular velocities. So this will be an alpha of B, W, B, alpha. Of B looks good. Only uh, independent use there, and then finally angular velocity of C, 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 C. Same. So we've got um, our accelerations that we're going to have to use all in terms of only the independent speeds and the time derivatives of independent speeds. All right. I think. We're ready for calculating F3S uh, as the first one. So we'll have um, the acceleration of BO. Right. And we've got to get the RRS first. So RS um, on AO equals negative M times in a and we're doing bo yep and then r the resultant acceleration on co minus m times a co and then we're going to have ts on acting on b and this is going to 
be much simpler because we only have the planar motion, so we just have to do um, I B dot with in alf B. TSC All right, I think those are good. Let me not name C. I missed a CO up here. And all right, now we finally are ready, I think, for this. So F 3S, the third um, non holonomic partial velocity. Right, we're going to have um, the th remember the third component is actually the first component in each of these partial velocities. So we'll do a V B O, the first one dotted with R S B O plus V. Uh, CO dotted with RSCO. Right, those are the two mass centers, and then we'll get the two terms from the rotational effects here T, S, uh, well, omega, B, zero dot TS, B, and then plus omega c zero dot t s c break that up so you can see all right so we get the the, the partial of uh, related to the third component there which is the first entry in our VCO, WC, WB, we dot them with the appropriate resultant inertia uh, forces and torques. And if I do my dynamic symbols F3S, I should get something only in the independent speeds, the derivatives, and the Qs. And I should be able to copy this now, and all we have to do is bump up our indices to get the fourth. And the fifth. All right, I think we have our equations of motion now. So our F R S is S M dot matrix F three S four S F5S. Okay. So FD equals FRS. We don't have an FR term. So we can extract the linear coefficients MD equals FRS dot Jacobian. Here we need a U dot, which I don't think we've defined. Uh, or have we? Oh, we have a Q dot, I believe. Yep, so we first need um, U, it's going to be US dot equals US diff. And then we'll get the Jacobian with respect to that. And we're also going to need a US D zero. To zero these out, US DI zero for US DI in US D. And then we'll get a GD equals FRS dot X replace USD zero. All right, um, it's worth checking the dynamic symbols of these, right? We should have extracted out all of the uh, U dots. GD, and it looks pretty good. I think we've now have our three independent um, 
dynamical differential equations here uh, that are only of the independent speeds and we have our uh, kinematical differential equations that's all ones so that's fine we should be able to simulate this thing now right so we need to evaluate all these matrices um, so I'll do eval k the kinematic and dynamic equals sm dot lambda phi we're going to give it the arguments um, we take all the q's only the independent u's right and um, notice that the dynamics don't depend on q1 which is uh, so we don't really need all those but q us and um, got some parameter values here which are p equals sm dot matrix um, it's just an l an m and an i right l m and an i and you know and one way to check that is uh, MD dot free symbols. Yep, L, M, and I. Uh, and I think that's all. That's, you can check them all, but I think we're fine. So we'll go with a P. And then we're going to evaluate um, M, K, TK, MD, GD. All right. So we can evaluate those. Let's um, define a right hand side function so that we can use it with the simulator. It takes a t first, it takes x, and then we can give it these extra parameter values p. Um, recall that uh, our x here is going to have all of the q's, right? Because we have n kinematical difference equations, but only the three independent u's. So the Q's are going to be the uh, first five things, and the U's will be the uh, last five. So, right, this is uh, actually US, so we should use that. And the Q's. And then um, if we do M, K, G, K, M, D, G, D equals eval. KD and we give it Q, Q's P. We should get those numerical results. Q dot then equals negative NP lin alg dot solve. So we solve this system of linear equations MK, GK, and USD equals minus NP dot lin alg dot solve MD, GD. All right, and then if we return, we stack those on top of each other. So I can use mp.h stack qd usd. I've got to give those in a tuple. And I also forgot to squeeze so we get the right dimensions that we want. All right, that looks about right, except we don't have numpy. So let's import numpy as np. All right, I think that will evaluate. Let's set up some initial conditions. So xo initial np dot array um, q1 and q2. Let's just make those zero. All right. Q1 in meters, Q2 in meters, and then uh, Q3, remember, is uh, the angle of the main board. Um, I think we just set that to zero also. Q3 in radians. Uh, Q4 and Q5, let's give them a little bit of motion 
heard a little bit of uh, initial variation there so I'm going to say degree actually let's just make everything zero at first so you we can see the effect of that okay four q5 it's also a radian and then we need uh, u3 u4 and u5 so u3 is actually we define that sort of interestingly um, because we didn't make the simple definition but u3 is i can find it uh right, u3 equals q3 dot times l over two so it's more like a a, a velocity type of term in meters per second and then and then a um, angular velocity so let's just say one meter per second there for u3 and the other two will be radians per second let's just start with uh, zero there too just to check this change these up in a minute u uh, five radians per second. All right, we'll also need some p vowels, some values for the uh, three parameters there. mp dot array. Um, we've got an l. Uh, let's just make that about uh, half a meter, I guess. Um, mass, let's say two kgs. Oh, that's for the mass of each of the yeah the foot plates. I'll say two each. It's pretty light, I guess. Mass in kg, and then the inertia term. Um, if the mass is one half, and maybe. Uh, Let's just do 0 0.5 times uh, uh, 0 0.01 meters squared or something like that to give it something that might be realistic for inertia. And that's in uh, kg times meter squared. All right. Now, let's see if our eval right-hand side function works. Give it an arbitrary time. Give it the XO and the P vowels. And we get a problem. A bunch of NANs pop out of here. We get a warning. The reason for this is we've got uh, a divide by zero likely here. So if we go back up to our equations here, right? I said if Q4 equals to Q5, we get a zero, a sine of zero, and then this thing doesn't like calculating. So if I made one of these, one e to the negative ten, right? Just a tiny value. It computes, and I get I get some some results here, right? So that divide by zero does matter here, and you have to watch out for that when we do these kind of uh, solves and substitutes. You're often going to end up with that kind of issue. But let's give uh, some actual initial angles here. Um, degree to radian uh, let's just say it's five degrees for Q4 we check that things are evaluating uh, and now we can try to simulate it to see what happens so bring in uh, uh, from scipy not integrate import solve IVP so we'll just do a spelled it wrong. See if this thing will simulate. Um, we've got some initial conditions. We got some p vowels, and um, so we'll have a solution equals solve i p p. We have to give it the p vowel right hand side. We have to give it some time. So we'll go zero point zero to uh, five seconds long 
and then um, we give it the x0 and then args equals p vowels comma it completed we get some results here so let's bring in matplotlib and I'm gonna bring in the interactive matplotlib graph so you can zoom and such with uh, this command little magic command matplotlib notebook and then just as a quick start peel we got a lot of variables there so well let's do plt dot plot sol dot t and then sol dot y are the solutions but let's just do um, let's just do x and y uh, the q1 and q2 right are the first two and then I have to transpose this to make the plot look nice all right we get something there it's a little jaggedy um, Let's see what the angles look like. So that'll take us up to five, I think. And I think we do need to create new figures on each plot. So we should just do fig comma x equals plt dot subplots. And then do ax dot plot. All right, those are some angles. Not too interpretable. We might want to increase the spacing of the T's. Let's do that to give a little bit better. So if I come back up here and I say T0, TF equals 0, 0.0 and 5.0, and then um, T span equals np dot lin space from t zero to t f and let's just do a hundred points and give us a little bit more and then we add t eval equals t span run it again plot there we go oh nice sine curves that looks interesting. And then um, I think we're still we're plotting the three lines two to five. Um, let's plot x versus y so we can sort of track the path. Ax dot plot sol dot y the first one that's q one and in the x direction and then two ah it goes in a circle Whew. all right if you do uh, ax dot set aspect equal and it's a perfect circle looks pretty pretty good so we actually the skateboard so if i started off with uh just this uh one meter per second and a five degree uh, Q uh, four value and then it looks like the skateboard just goes in a circle there and that's why this angle grows to 20 degrees and the other two angles don't so I think we're getting somewhat realistic you uh, want to check some of these values what if I do something like NP degree radian to and do a negative three degrees on Q5 angle as a start, simulate, and still get a circular motion. Same result. Let's try a little bit of angular velocity in. Um, let me do a 0 0.5 in one of the U's. Okay, there's some different behavior. Sort of like an unstable motion. Uh, quite crazy. So it doesn't like that 
must be too high of a value. 05, maybe. Similar. So it, is, whoop, it does these funny, crazy, crazy pattern, right? Well, I'm like an hour and 20 minutes in here. I think you get the point. I've, uh, I'm simulating things. Seems like it's basically working. You can use see the check out the animation in the notes. The animation will help you understand it. is it really working as expected. And you know the process at this point is to try different initial conditions and parameter values, trying to make them realistic, thinking about what you might expect to see in the motion, and investigating whether or not you actually are getting realistic motion. And I think we are here. This kind of behavior uh, is a common common things you'll see in these non-holonomic systems, right? Um, it uh, you know is traveling almost 10 meters here, and that going quite fast and uh, making these shapes. I guess if we slow things down to like uh, 0.2 meters per second there, maybe we get something that's not so, we get a couple of uh, distinct changes, something that's a little more interpretable. Uh, so we get a couple. And I think you'll see in my um, in the results, which we can check out the animation for the non-holonomic here, and you can play with that and see what other kind of motions you get. Um, we do see this kind of behavior. So once it reaches certain angular velocity, the body sort of flips around, it catches itself, and then um, makes these interesting shapes. So maybe this, you know, this might not be exactly, this isn't exactly how the snake board works because the snake board can't turn over top of itself, uh, but you could and in the homework, you're going to have to make it a little more realistic uh, to a, a real skate snake board. All right, that's an hour and 20 minutes in. You've got your non-holonomic systems. You, you should know how to simulate them at this point and set them up. Um, and that's whatever this was, 13, 14.1 or, or something. 13.1. Okay, bye-bye.